and basically all of this previous work that we've done is the preparation for the Euler equations, and the same schemes that we've presented for the nonlinear Burgers equations are going to be applicable for Euler now, which is a model, of course, of compressible fluid mechanics with no viscosity in viscid fluid, in viscid fluid motion. So, if you recall, the fluid, the, the, from your fluids courses, the Euler equations, we're going to write them in conservation form. And they are as follows. You have the first equation is conservation of mass. So it's compressible flow. So we have an equation for the conservation of mass. That is rho the density, d rho dt, plus d dx of rho u equals 0. This is continuity equation. Second equation is the conservation of momentum, d dt of the quantity rho u plus d dx. And here we write it in conservation form, which means basically that every spatial derivative that appears in the equation is a gradient. So we put all of these together. This is the conservation of momentum. And we're going to use the conservation form of the Euler equations because, um, well, there's several reasons, but in, there was a lot of research and results published in the 1960s and early 1970s that showed that using the conservation form is more accurate for calculations of the Euler equations on compressible flows whenever shock waves can appear. And um, so this is the traditional way that we use the equations in compressible fluids. Now, you will note that, of course, the pressure appears here in the incompressible scenario, we dealt with the issue of the pressure by, um, you know, we talked a lot about this, um, taking the gradient of the momentum equation and um, doing some manipulations which allowed us to obtain a Poisson equation for pressure, right? Okay, so in the case of compressible flow, we don't, we, we don't, we, don't, we cannot do that because we have a full continuity equation here. Um, in remembering the incompressible case, the continuity equation was expressed simply by the divergence of velocity equal to zero, and we used that equation in the derivation of the Poisson equation for pressure. We don't, we don't, we can't do any of that here. So we need another equation, basically here. The pressure, which appears here in the momentum equation, is not a conserved quantity, so we don't have um, a conservation law for pressure. Instead, we need to introduce the energy equation. Uh, we introduce the energy as an additional variable and the conservation of energy as our additional equation, which, with the equation of state, allows us to close the system. Okay, so... We need this additional variable, the energy. So I hope you recall from your uh, thermodynamics uh, the equation of energy, but we'll just remind you of some of the um, ways that we write energy for fluids uh, so that we can write an energy equation. So we're going to use a specific specific meaning per unit mass, total energy, which we're going to write as little e with a subscript t, and this is defined as, of course it depends on time, this is uh, time and space, and this is all 1d, so x and t, e, the internal energy, and u squared half, which is our potential energy. So, 
This is the internal energy per unit time. Sorry, per unit mass. And this is the potential, uh, sorry, this is the uh, kinetic. And all of this is per unit mass. So we're also going to use the specific total enthalpy where the enthalpy is defined as so HT is equal to simply the energy plus P over rho This is the total enthalpy, and this is enthalpy plus u squared over 2. So this guy is the thermodynamic enthalpy here, which is E plus P over rho. You probably remember this one. We simply add the kinetic energy which gives us, instead of simply E, gives us E total. So now the energy equation can be written. This is our third equation, the energy equation. We can either write it in terms of E total or in terms of the enthalpy. So DDT of rho E total plus the flux term rho u e total plus p u. This is equal to zero, but it's also equal to ddt. This term doesn't change, rho e total. But the other term we can write in terms of the enthalpy as ddx rho u h total. So we have these two forms of the energy equation in terms of enthalpy or with the pressure appearing explicitly here. And like I said, we need this extra equation because we don't have an equation for pressure. Pressure is not a conserved quantity, but energy is. And so this helps us to have an additional equation. Everything is coupled. Uh, we have three differential equations which involve velocity and pressure. Pressure appears in two and three. Velocity appears in all of the equations. And we also have energy, but the energy and the pressure are related by an equation of state. So this is a closed system now. So this is one of the features of compressible fluid mechanics, compressible computational fluid mechanics. We need to solve for the energy together with momentum and mass. Okay, now this is going to be just a 1D presentation for the time being, but you can see that even in 1D this gets a little bit complicated because we have three equations. If it was, if we start adding more spatial dimensions, then this is going to get a little bit more, more messy. And so for that reason, it is very useful to um, uh, use some compact notation. This is the vector form of the equations, also called the short form. And it's very compact and very useful to write the equations in this way by defining a column vector of conserved variables. So the conserved variables we write in vector form as we're going to use u, u vector to represent Rho, rho u, 
and rho energy. And these are the conserved variables altogether. Then we're going to have a flux vector, which is going to be all of the stuff that appears in the gradient operator in our equations. Call it F vector, and it is going to be rho u for the first equation, rho u squared plus p for the momentum equation, and then we have rho e total plus p times u. This is one of the versions, and then of course we have the version that um, changes the third equation, introducing the enthalpy. So it could be rho u, rho u squared plus p, and rho h total u. So these, this flux vector, which we can refer to as F1, F2, and F3, where these represent, each one of these terms represent the conservation of mass, so the, or the term of the conservation of mass that corresponds to the mass flux, mass flux, momentum flux, and the energy flux, total energy flux plus pressure. Pressure work. These are the three terms. So this is called a flux vector, and indeed, when you look at these uh, terms for mass and momentum, they do correspond physically to a flux in terms of um, the derivation of the conservation equations. If you go back and read that little, you know, it's uh, only a few pages uh, handout that I put on Blackboard about the conservation laws, uh, they do correspond to physically a flux, but the third component of this flux vector has something else. It's a flux plus pressure work. We still call it a flux and just, you know, understand that it includes this pressure in there. We don't worry about it. it the pressure effects are included. Now, using this vector notation, then the Euler equations completely get written in a very, very convenient and, as I said, it's called the short form. It's simply du dt, where u is now the whole vector, plus d dx of the flux terms equal to zero. This is the whole 1D order equations now written in a short form. Thanks to this vector notation. Now we note here that um, F is a function of the conserved quantities, U, and so DF DX is equal to DF DU times DU DX, simply chain rule. Right? Where here this 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 guy over here DF DU corresponds to the matrix of partial derivatives D F one D U one TF2, DU1, 
Tf3, Tu1 is our first column. The second column is going to be the partials with respect to the second component of U. So we have Df1, Du2, Tf1, so Df2, Du2, and Df3, Du2. And the final column is with respect to the third component of U. So this is, this matrix is called the Jacobian matrix of F. Which, if we denote by the letter A, it allows us to write the whole equation as du dt plus, here that is the same term, a du dx equal to zero. This is pretty short, and it also looks quite familiar, right? Now, this very simple equation reminds us of the scalar. It looks like the scalar convection equation that we've been, you know, that simp the most simple of all equations, right, is the linear convection equation in 1D. Now, it looks, this looks pretty much the same, with the only difference that it, it's applied to a vector, and of course the coefficients are is, is now a coefficient matrix. But with this analogy, we can start applying the same numerical schemes that we learned to use for the nonlinear um, convection to the Euler equations. And we can solve fluids with this very simple equation which represents a full Euler system in a very simple form. So this is what we're going to do next. We're going to write down some, uh, some of the um, numerical schemes for the Euler equation and describe how one would program a solution for compressible flow using these. But uh, to be able to introduce the problems that we're going to, the, pro the, the, the type of problems that we're going to use this on, I'm going to take a little parenthesis to describe a particular family of problems that are solved in, well, not only in compressible flow, but um, in um, this whole, the whole branch of hyperbolic systems or hyperbolic special differential equations. And these are called Riemann problems. <laughs>